<laughs> Welcome to the first ECR Wednesday webinar of 2019, hosted by eLife, the series that aims to give early career researchers a platform to discuss issues important to you and your research career. Today, we will be discussing how to create effective figures. In the second half of the webinar, we'll put your questions to our speaker. To ask a question, you can type in the question box on the GoToWebinar functions panel, or you can tweet us, we are at eLife Community, using the ECR Wednesday hashtag. Finally, I'd just like to let you know that we are recording the webinar and we'll make it available on YouTube in the near future. Now I'll pass over to Brian to introduce today's expert speaker. Thank you, Emma, and hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our Early Career Researcher Wednesday webinar on graphic design tips for creating effective scientific figures. My name is Brianne Kent, and I'm a postdoc and chair of the eLife Early Career Advisory Group. I will be the moderator for today's webinar. Just a word about our host. eLife is a nonprofit organization and an initiative led by scientists for scientists with the mission to improve all aspects of research communication in support of excellence in science. And they do that through open science and open technology innovation. The goal is to encourage and recognize the most responsible behaviors in science. eLife makes it a priority to support early career researchers and for the past five years has had an early career advisory group. This webinar series, ECR Wednesdays, is just one of the initiatives that eLife has launched to help support the early career community. I would now like to welcome our speaker, Dr. Anne Martin, who is a professional graphic designer turned neuroscientist. After working as a professional designer for six years, Anne received her doctorate in neurobiology and anatomy from the University of Utah in 2018, and is now a postdoc at the University of Oregon. Over the next hour, Dr. Martin will offer us advice on best practices for visual communication. As scientists, Presenting ideas and data graphically is essential for effective communication, and yet we often receive little guidance or training. I am personally very grateful for Dr. Martin being here today because I find creating graphics for my manuscripts and presentations the most daunting task of communicating my ideas and results. Graphs and figures are the first thing I look to when I'm reading a paper, and yet it is the part of my own work that I Red. So thank you, Anne, for being here. I am very much looking forward to picking up some tips. For everyone tuning in, please follow us on Twitter at eLife Community and with the hashtag ECR Wednesday. You can also submit questions using the side panel and we will do our very best to answer them during the Q&A session. I now welcome Dr. Martin to share best practices from graphic design. So you can go ahead and share your screen. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm just waiting for the link to pop up here that should allow me to share my screen. There it goes. All right. Let's see. So it looks like that is working out well. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, very happy to be here. And I want to especially thank the organizers for allowing me to talk about this topic today. Um, I also would like to thank our host eLife for uh, allowing this webinar series to exist in the first place. So let's go ahead and get started talking about graphic design. So now uh, in thinking about what makes an effective figure, it's helpful perhaps to consider the reverse question. What makes a bad figure? And so I put out this question to Science Twitter a few months ago and asked what makes a bad figure? I received many different responses. Um, which you can see here. We have items ranging from having tons of panels of data, absent text, a figure legend that's longer than a page itself, uh, no error bars. And so when you look at these different responses, you can see that they typically fall within two different camps. We have either too much information or we have too little information. So clearly there's a balance that needs to be struck when we're designing our figures. We need to make sure that while we're not overwhelming with too much, uh, we also are providing that essential context that makes figures understandable. 
So today during this webinar, I am going to be talking about uh, graphic design in three different contexts. So first, I'm going to offer some insight into design thinking. Then I'm going to talk about our graphic design toolkit. So what sorts of elements of figure design can we use in order to communicate our, our information, our research? And then finally, uh, I'm going to offer some input on graphs and then give you some additional resources to go to. So let's get started thinking about design. Now, uh, let's think about this particular question. What is a researcher's ultimate goal in creating a figure? Now, clearly, we've done the science, we have all of this information, all of this data, and we need to transfer it to a reader in a clear and understandable way. So perhaps the main ultimate goal is just to show our, the evidence for our findings in a clear manner. But I think that in searching for graphical excellence, uh, the giant of the data visualization world put it best. And he said uh, that graphical excellence is that which gives the reader or the viewer the greatest number of ideas in the shortest time with the least ink in the smallest space. And that's a quote from Edward Tufte. And so there's a lot of information to unpack here, a lot of ideas. But typically, we have this thought of, OK, we have so much information and we need to convey it, but we know that simplicity is key. We know that the least amount of ink and space we use in order to transfer this idea, um, the better it will be, the easier it will be to consume. So we have these two ideas of clarity and efficiency. Uh, we want things to be clear, but we need to be efficient with the way that we explain them. So how do we embrace clarity and efficiency in our figures? The first question to ask in order to do this is who is our audience? Now, for instance, in given, giving this webinar, my audience is quite broad. So I have early career researchers, potentially even as early as undergraduates, um, up to perhaps even PIs. And so the information that I'm giving you today is going to be both basic and complex. So hold tight if you're feeling like information is a little bit basic, we'll dig in deep in areas. Now, in building your research figure, uh, perhaps the most enlightening uh, question you can ask is what type of journal you're going to be submitting to, because you're going to frame information very differently depending upon what journal audience you're talking to. For instance, if I'm submitting to a journal like Hippocampus, I might not need to explain where the hippocampus is within um, a mouse brain. Um, that's probably something that's already known by people reading Hippocampus. On the reverse, if I am submitting to science, uh, I might need to include a great deal more context of where the hippocampus is in order to clearly uh, explain my research findings. You also need to consider individual needs and backgrounds. So for instance, everyone coming to your research paper might not be looking for the same thing. You might have someone who is reading the paper trying to learn about a very particular method that's only covered in some of the figures. So perhaps they won't have followed the story from the initial uh, figure, and they won't be able to uh, know the details that you've placed there um, very quickly. So in order to be able to be efficient with their time and get them to the information they need, you need to consider each figure on its own as well as, as, as the whole. Uh, similarly, we're all humans, but there's a wide range in our abilities. And so, for instance, we have young humans, we have old humans. Sometimes that small type can be very difficult to read. So make sure that your figure is accessible for all individuals. Lastly, we also have different processes of review. So a, a large uh, proportion of the population will probably consume their media digitally. But we also have individuals who will be printing out figures and perhaps even printing them out in grayscale. And so uh, being able to understand a figure even in grayscale is a critical point to address. So how do you frame your paper for your audience? And even more largely, how do you organize a paper in the first place? Now, typically, I was taught to start very broad and then get more specific over time. And this is reflected in the way that our papers are typically organized. You start off with an introduction that introduces the broad topic, and then you get more specific as you go into your results, showing your experiments that you're using to test your hypotheses. And then finally, ending with your discussion, which is placing those results back into a larger whole and identifying the niche um, that you have carved out. <clears throat> 
And this needs to be reflected also in your figures. So in figure one, you're basically creating that context that you're going to refer to throughout the, the paper. In your middle figures, you're providing your specific points of evidence. And then perhaps in your final figure, you're showing a model or showing how uh, your findings fit within a larger framework. In addition, you also potentially have supplemental figures. Um, and these include things like controls and clarifications that you also need to fit within this figure framework. So how can we take advantage of graphic design in order to tell this story? And what I'd like to really try to convince you today is that you need to build a visual system. You need to help everyone unconsciously follow along with your story by setting a series of standard conventions that you follow, beginning in your first figure and then following throughout. And these are things such as keeping your data ordered the same way. So for instance, if I'm showing a series of graphs throughout these different papers, and I'm using the same sorts of conditions throughout, I'd like to keep them ordered in the same manner. So for instance, if I start with a wild type, then I show a head, and then I show a knockout, keep that same order in each of your graphs as you're going throughout the paper. Similarly, you can standardize how you label data. Let's say that I'll be showing a series of immunostains. Beginning in the first figure, I can set a standard by which I put the condition perhaps on the left-hand side, here and then use uh, the top area to perhaps show what antibody stain or the timing that I'm using. And then I can keep that standard throughout each of my figures. And then finally, you'll want to use design elements consistently. So for instance, here I'm showing you the design element of color. And again, if I was using a sample such as a wild type, a het, and a knockout, um, I can use color to establish, for instance, that wild type is black and keep that the same throughout all of my figures. Um, this is also helpful because it shows when you introduce something new. So if I have consistently used, for instance, black for wild type, green for knockout, if I suddenly introduce red, the reader will identify that and note, oh wait, there's something new here. I don't know what that color designates. I need to make sure I understand how this is different from what I'm already familiar with. And so that can be a really helpful way of not only uh, allowing the reader to follow along quickly, but to pick up small changes that might occur throughout your paper. And so I mentioned using design elements consistently, but what are these design elements? What graphical tools do we have in order to communicate? And so next, I'm going to be going over the elements of figure design or these graphical tools. And these include items such as type selection, location, shape, size, color, and line. So these are the basic tools that we have in order to communicate. Let's get started with type selection. So type typically comes in two different types, haha, or flavors. We have sans serif fonts and we have serif fonts. And if you're not familiar with the difference, if you look at the bottom of this graphic here, outlined in red is showing you what a serif is. It's basically a small ornament that's tagged on um, to create uh, a, a different feeling within the font. And so if you look on the right here, there are three different examples of these different types of fonts. Um, you can see Times New Roman, which is a serif font, and Arial and Helvetica, which are common sans serif fonts. Now in science, typically, uh, we use sans serif fonts because they're more legible and easier to read. And so I'd like to encourage you to choose a sans serif font throughout your figures. Now I know that it's a lot of fun to pick out different typefaces, uh, different fonts, and you might have one that you particularly love, like perhaps papyrus is just, ah, oh, it just sparks such joy. But let's put that to the side for the moment um, and realize that first and foremost, our primary goal is to communicate effectively. And the best way to do that is with the most read uh, readily uh, legible font. So let's keep it to a sans serif font for now. Also, you'll notice that for several different grant applications, um, they'll actually specify uh, sans serif fonts like Arial and Helvetica for this precise reason. Now, there is an exception to this, uh, and this would be called Courier. Uh, this is a font that is very helpful, particularly if you're using sequences. You can see here that I've lined up several different uh, base pairs, and you can see, especially on this bottom line here, that uh, the letters are no longer lining up. 
I have several different A's and the A's are much wider than the other letters. And so I'm not getting my nice uh, consistently lined up base pairs. Courier, however, is a fixed width font. And so here you can see that even though um, in the above font, the widths are different, in Courier, it's kept the same. And so this can be a great trick for have, if you're having to display uh, a different, uh, if you're having to display sequences. Now, when we start adding type to a page, uh, we need to think in terms of a hierarchy that we're creating and how we're guiding the eye along the page. And that we can do that through different type sizes. So for instance, you'll notice that in the header here, um, we have the largest type size. And so your eye directly goes there to find out what precisely it is that we're going to be learning about in this graph. And then next, you'll identify uh, the axes at the next largest size. And then finally, you'll get into the actual scale and looking at the actual differences between the data points. And so just by using type size, we've identified in a logical flow how we want someone to consume this information. And so you'll want to keep that in mind throughout your entire figure and just knowing how you're guiding the eye based off of the type size that you're employing. One thing to keep in mind, particularly with graphs, is that you don't want to stack type. So on the right here, you can see that one letter is placed each above the other such that uh, it spells out the word. However, this is very confusing to read. It actually takes more time to type out as well. And so it, you're much better off just taking the entire word and shifting it on its axis. This is much more easier to read. Next, uh, for breaks in type, um, typically whenever we're typing out a sentence and we have one word flow over, um, we don't think too much about it. But in a figure, it causes uh, the eye to be dragged off to the side and then it has to jump back in order to catch up that next word. And so it actually takes longer to consume and it also can alter the positioning of what you're working with. So for instance, if this was the title for a graph and we looked at the lazy fox jumped to the river, uh, it might overflow the graph in such a way that causes a problem. Whereas if we break it instead, right down the middle, the lazy fox and then break, jump the river, it keeps the sentence nicely positioned with the graph and allows you to consume that information that much faster. I also want to caution you against light type on a dark background. I think we've all attended a lecture in which someone placed a bright yellow type onto a dark blue background. And after a few slides, you just can't consume it anymore. It just becomes too much for your eyes. And so what I want to instead encourage is for you to use a dark type on a light background. Now there might be the occasion where, for instance, when you're building a model figure that you absolutely have to use light type on a dark background. If this is the case, I would encourage you to make it into a bolder setting uh, so that the lines actually thicken so that it's easier to read. And also you can move to using all caps instead of uh, using uh, both cap settings. And what this will allow is for it to be more legible. This is also a good trick for if you're displaying type in a very small size. Uh, you can also make it bolder and make it all caps and this will help out with it being in that smaller type size. I'd also like to ask you to please limit abbreviations. So believe it or not, these are all abbreviations that I've seen in scientific papers. Someone actually shortened reward to R-E-W. Uh, so uh, think about when you're coming to this figure, uh, as Brienne mentioned, it's the first thing she looks at. And if you're constantly having to look up these abbreviations, you're going back and forth and back and forth. Um, and it can be very frustrating trying to figure out a number of abbreviations. There's a simple rule um, that is, exists within the field that if you have to, uh, if you can Google an abbreviation, then it's probably safe to use. Uh, but if you can't Google it, then try coming up with an alternate word or uh, try uh, finding a different solution. Uh, next, please don't stretch your type. So we're all scientists, we're all researchers, and we're all presenting this data, trying to show uh, what we found, find, showing our uh, findings. 
And whenever you alter that data, or even just the type surrounding it by stretching it, you're causing the reader to lose faith in what you're showing and to lose trust in that you're displaying your findings accurately. And so don't stretch your type because it can make someone think that you're not actually showing them the raw version of the data. So just to provide an example, let's see how we can improve the text on this graph. I know this is a bit of an extreme case, but uh, it I feel like it really makes these different points. So first off, your eye directly goes straight to those fluorescent colors. Um, they're very bright and eye-catching. Next, probably, you look over and you see density that's stretched over here. And what I typically question whenever I see this is there's a, a certain amount of stretching that's happening to, the, to this axis, but yet the data doesn't quite appear to be stretched. So how did they stretch one thing and not the other? I'm very confused. Um, and so I'm, I'm losing faith that this person is actually portraying their data in a, in a scientific manner. So how can we improve this? Well, clearly, we don't want to stretch the type. I've also muted the colors so that you can pay attention to what's around the graph as well, so you can pay attention to that text. And also, uh, we can see that the title has now been increased in size, so it's the first thing that you see. Then we look at the axes, then we look at the actual data points, and uh, we're able to consume this graph in a more logical manner. So let's move on to our next graphical element, and this being location. Whenever we read a figure, uh, typically we read it just the same way we read a book. We read from left to right, top bot to bottom. And so we start up here in the top left, consume to the right, go down, consume to the right. And so as we build a figure, we want to employ that same method. We don't want to list A above B and then jump back up to C and then D. We want to keep that horizontal left to right orientation. Now, when we're grouping data together, uh, there are many different ways that you can use positioning or location in order to group things. Um, particularly, let's look at this example. So we have a number of squares and circles, and based on their similarities of being color and shape, we're naturally dividing this top line from the second line. But what happens when we put a gap between the two? Now we're using white space in order to identify that the items on the left are together as a group and the items on the right are together as a group. And so this proximity has now taken our original groups and subdivided them. Then you can also employ the use of enclosures. Enclosures will also group your data and even though we have this gap here, we're still recognizing that this line is demarcating how uh, information is put together within a group. Where I see this play a distinct role, for instance, is in a graph like this. So uh, this is very similar to a graph that I viewed recently in a paper, and this graph has many different problems, um, perhaps primarily being uh, the lack of the axes, the, the y and um, x-axis titles. But the point of confusion, especially that I ran into with a similar graph, is this addition here of the plus cocaine that's in the top right. I don't know what that is referring to. It could refer to uh, the color and be identifying the data that's shown in black. Um, it could be identifying a time at which uh, this was added to the experiment. Um, but there's really not a framework for me to understand this. But because of the proximity of that word, it's causing this to be confusing. Now, I think this is meant to be time point zero and then uh, the addition of the drug over this time. But really, we can't get that input from this graph. And so try to think about how, when you're adding this sort of information in, how you can make it um, such that you're not introducing um, thoughts that uh, you're not intending. I also want to mention that items should be placed in the order that they're mentioned within the paper. So for instance, if you talk about item 2A in your introduction, uh, and then you talk about item 1A, you'll be dinged on that because you need to talk about things in a logical fashion, and you need to keep your, the items in your paper ordered in the way that you mention them. I'd also like you to pay attention to alignment and to white space. 
So you can see the chaos that we've represented on the left here. Um, we have a bunch of squares and a bunch of circles, and we can't really identify what's meant to be tied together, clearly. Everything's just kind of scattered all over the place, and there doesn't seem to be any order that's telling us what to look at first or what's significant. Now, if I align all of these items, it's much easier to consume. It's easier to see, for instance, the number of different circles that we have, um, but we also don't have any particular hierarchy between these items. It seems that everything's been given equal weight. And the way that you can create this hierarchy is to pay attention to white space. Just like with type, white space can allow you to guide the eye and to find particular items before you find others. Now for an extreme example of this, this is a wild and crazy amount of information to unpack. Um, we've got type all over the place, graphics all over the place. Uh, and even though uh, type might be aligned to particular graphics, it's just too close together and you can't distinguish it in your eye. So let's calm it down and introduce some white space. And now we can get a sense of where our eye is supposed to go. We can tell that this uh, comment or this caption in bold is identified with these two images at the very top. We can see that there's then a title uh, that follows above these three individual graphics that have their own descriptions. And so just by changing the white space and changing the organization of how we've introduced these graphics, we've made it such that we can actually consume this data in a logical fashion. Next, let's talk about shape and size. So if you're going to try to distinguish between two different ideas using two different types of shapes, you have to be able to easily understand the difference between them. Now clearly, if I were to be creating a graph and I was going to identify data points based off of shape, these two would be poor choices because they're so similar. Especially when I reduce them in size, it's going to be very difficult to tell the difference between the two. If you're going to be showing data points along a graph and you want to show two different groups, use shapes that are very different, such as a triangle versus a circle. I want to make sure to point out something about arrows. So if we look at the arrow on the left, we can see that there are three different points to this arrow that are all given equal weight. So if I want to point to something, for instance, in an immunostain, and I use this arrow, I could be pointing to any one of three different areas, and it's not clear what it would be. However, if I use the arrow on the right, it has a very clear focal point you can see that this arrow has directionality and that if it's actually pointing at something within a figure, I'll be able to tell uh, with accuracy the one point that I'm supposed to look at. So make sure that your arrows have direction. You can use shape and size in order to establish focal points. So let's look at this series of shapes that we have here. We have one that's very large and a different shape in the center, and that's the one that your eye will go to first. Then it will go to the circles that are around, typically following their size. So we consume the item in the middle, then we go to the larger of the circles, and then to the smaller. And so employing this within your graphic can allow you to focus in on the clear point of information that you want the person to consume first, and then follow by going around in sequence. One trend that I've noticed lately in figures is that it's become a little bit flashy to use area to depict a difference in percentage. And I'd like to caution you against this. So if we were to look at the very top here, where we've got wild type and knockout next to these two different lines, if I were to ask you uh, what percentage is the wild type of the knockout, it's fairly easy to assume that perhaps it's around 33% the size of the knockout. Now, if I was to ask you that same question down here with these two different circles, it's much harder in order to tell what the actual difference is between the two. Our eye has a much harder time distinguishing area than it does length. So for instance, with these two bottom circles, I don't know that I could tell you it was 30% or 40%. It's very hard to get a judge on how different these two samples actually are. Whereas with the length, you get it automatically. Next is perhaps everyone's favorite element to use, which is color, and the one that I get the most questions on. 
And I want to emphasize to you that color is to be used as an aid and to never be relied on to communicate information. And the reason why I'm saying this is illustrated on the left. So we have two different lines representing two different sets of data. And these lines are identified by color based on this legend here that you see on the right. Now, if I print this in grayscale, I'm probably going to lose that information and I'll lose any ability to tell what this data actually is uh, because I can't focus on uh, what the color designation actually is saying. So uh, what I can do instead is simply label each line with what the data actually is. So now it doesn't matter. The color has been taken out of the equation. And while it's an aid, and while when I look from graph to graph, it will be helpful um, if I'm vi uh, viewing it in a color um, frame, uh, I'm not reliant upon that to get uh, the information across. Now, what about in a context such as this? So here I'm graphing just an example of the number of animals my dog found in the past year. Not really, but it's a fun example. Um, and here I'm using a rainbow spectrum of colors. Is this a problem that I'm using so many colors that can be really close together um, and hard to distinguish for someone who is, for instance, colorblind? Well, uh, what you can see is that for each individual column, the label is appearing at the bottom. And so the data isn't reliant upon the color, it's actually labeled uh, in each case. And so you can still understand the information even if you lose the color. A place where that doesn't hold true is for a map orientation such as this. Now, if you take a quick glance at this map of the United States, what you might conclude is that, wow, there is something very different about the western half of the US from the eastern half of the US, because the difference between this light green and this dark green is so um, emphasized. And so it really creates this dividing line between west and east. However, when you actually look at the legend down here below, what you'll find is that these two color points are designating values that are right next to each other. So there's actually no larger difference between this light green and this dark green than there is between the green and that light blue. Um, it's just uh, the harshness of the value change that's making you conclude that these two uh, areas are so different when really it, it's a very similar uh, result. And so rainbow maps such as this can give very misleading indications of these scale differences. And I'll be sharing with you in a moment a resource that particularly if you're building a map like this will allow you to build a uh, color based on value instead of based off of um, hue difference. And what that means is uh, value is based off of darkness of color. So for instance, if you have 10% blue, 20% blue, 30% blue, you're increasing uh, darkness uh, on a scale um, as opposed to choosing you know, a red versus um, a green based off of hue. And so making these sorts of maps based off of value instead of actual uh, color differences, hue differences, can be very helpful in making uh, these sorts of things more easily understood. You can also use commonly known color associations, but you have to do it wisely. For instance, in this example, uh, that's a little bit of a harsh thing to understand. Uh, we're typically, uh, we think of this in terms of hot is, is red and cold is blue. And so if we reverse that, we're losing this opportunity to make a natural connection and a quick um, understanding of, the, of a graph or of information because we've reversed these commonly known color associations. So try and have a logical reason for choosing the colors that you're using. Another place where we fall into this uh, problem is with a heat map. So we're very accustomed to seeing heat maps done in two diverging colors, such for instance as uh, green and red. However, this is very problematic for someone, for instance, who is colorblind because they can't distinguish those colors very easily. And so uh, heat maps such as this could be completely lost on someone who isn't able to understand color in the same, uh, isn't able to visualize color in the same manner. And so this is a very cool graphic that I'm showing you from IBM in which we're showing normal color vision and then simulating the different forms of color blindness. And you can see the diversity here of how you can actually uh, 
read color between these different um, versions of color blindness. And so as I mentioned, I'd like to offer you a few different resources to help out with this. Um, there are many different resources for choosing color palettes. Uh, this is a question that I get all the time. Of, I want to choose really good colors um, to show my data, but where do I go in order to pick those? And so a few places that you can go are ibm.com, design language, um, c-o-o-l-o-r-s.co, and then also colorbrewer2.org. This last one in particular will show you a map and show you colors that you can choose to distinguish areas on a map very helpfully. Now, I also mentioned that earlier you can use value in order to choose different colors and that you need to think about this logically. And what I mean is, for instance, let's say we're trying to show differences in concentration. And so we could use white to represent uh, zero. And then increasing with the concentration, we could increase the color and value. You could also use what's called a diverging scale in which you set a midpoint, um, and this is commonly what's done with heat maps, and then in one direction you can take it in increasing intensity of one color, and in the other direction uh, increasing intensity of another color. And then finally for uh, one other color palette option, there's also categorical, and this is actually just labeling categories based off of different colors. So for instance, a rat could be represented by orange, a dog represented by purple. And then in order to test your figures and make sure that they are colorblind safe, uh, we have two different options here. I used to always uh, emphasize VizCheck as a good option to go to, but their server has been down quite a bit lately. And so as an alternative, I haven't used it personally, but Color Oracle is another option in which you can actually upload your figure and then it will show you how that figure is perceived under different colorblind scenarios. Now finally here, we're going to get to line, which is our last graphical element to discuss. And so let's look at how line affects how we, can, how we visualize these two different squares. If we look on the left, our eye naturally goes here because we have this darkened stroke around the square. Um, it's denoting a hierarchy by getting our eye to go directly to that particular shape. But you don't want to do this too much because if you have several differing line widths, then you basically create chaos. Now your, your eye is going all over the place. It doesn't know where to focus. And you also can't identify gr these groups based off of line width either because it's, the differences are so small that you can actually pick them out in a quick manner. So you don't want to use these line widths excessively. I would choose one or two maybe max in order to distinguish items. You can also use dotted lines to show a cutout. So here I have a sample uh, color block on the left and I'm using a small dotted line in order to create a region of interest. And then I'm increasing that on the right and I've also increased the actual dots to show that I'm zooming in in space. And so you can use these sorts of changes in line width to show uh, a difference in dimension as well. I do want to caution you about using lines without fills and graphs. Um, so let's go back to the same uh, graph where I was looking at the number of animals my dog had found. And you can see that it's hard to get an idea of the differences because the lines are creating an optical uh, issue with being able to distinguish one column from the next. Even if we then employ color and try and show these differences, still those lines are thin and difficult to resolve. and so. Instead, I would encourage you to use fills in your graphs. So now lastly here in the last few minutes, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, some concerns with graphs and also provide some resources that you can go to. Graphs uh, are a difficult element because they have to be able to stand alone. I need to be able to know just from the information that's present in your graph what exactly you're comparing. And there are a number of critical elements that are oftentimes left out um, that uh, really you need for context in order to understand a figure. One of these problems is labeling consistency. So for instance, if you suddenly change uh, your variables from being on the bottom, for instance, to suddenly being on the left, it's jarring and it takes a moment in order for uh, the reader to be able to understand what you're showing. 
So let's keep um, measurement on, for instance, the y-axis variables on the x-axis and uh, keep these consistent throughout your paper. Again, you want to label all components and don't rely on color. I know this is something I've brought up before, but it really is something that is a problem and uh, has been done so many times. We typically think of GFP, for instance, as being green and M cherry as being red or magenta, but you really need to actually put those labels on there to make sure that it's understandable for the reader. I'd also like you to, to encourage you to keep all your scales the same. This is perhaps the most difficult to achieve uh, because I know when we're generating those plots that sometimes the scale is automatically chosen um, and perhaps you don't even realize that it's altered so much um, when you're creating your figures. But it can be something that makes a, a figure very difficult to understand and causes uh, the reader to have to pause and think about it more clearly or perhaps they don't even catch it. So just off the bat, looking at these two different graphs, it seems as if the result is very similar, um, if not the exact same. But when we then look at the scale, we can see that it's very different between the two, which can cause you to conclude something um, erroneous from what you intended. And finally, I know this is also repetitive, but also very important. Try to order your data in the same way throughout your paper. Um, so if you choose an order of elements that you're showing initially, like GFP, M cherry, then Venus, keep those the same throughout the paper. Um, in particular, this can be frustrating if you're ordering Western blots and you're trying to keep the order the same with whatever Western blot you're showing. Um, but uh, try to apply this throughout your full figure and keep things ordered in the same manner. And so I'd just like to finish up here by offering you a few uh, further resources that you can go to um, for graphs. Uh, there are a few different really awesome websites you, you can visit. Uh, the R Graph Gallery, particularly if you're generating your graphs in R, um, offers you a lot of different options and shows you how to make um, many different types of graphs. And I know today I've been showing you uh, basic bar graphs to generate data, um, but that absolutely is not an endorsement of using bar graphs for everything. Certainly showing different data points is, is something that you uh, should consider doing. And so our graph gallery will show you how to do those different things. GraphPad is another great website to go to. Um, GraphPad makes Prism, uh, which I typically use to generate my graphs. And they have a number of different tutorials to show you how to generate these. Also, functional art and flowing data, both will help you choose what types of graphs are appropriate for your data type. Moving on to data visualization, uh, edwardtufty.com, I mentioned him before as being a real giant in the data viz world. Um, and he has many different lessons uh, that you can go to in order to learn more about graphic design. Uh, there's a new resource that recently has come out, uh, serialmentor.com slash data viz. Um, this is by uh, a man named Klaus uh, Wilkie, who has put together this really wonderful resource of a lot of different data, visualiz data visualization tools and tricks. Um, and it's very comprehensive and gives you really great examples of successful data visualization and ones that you want to avoid. Uh, also, uh, the ECR Life blog um, at ecrlife.org. Uh, there's a great blog post by Dr. Helena uh, Javor uh, that gives you some tips and tricks for uh, making better figures. And uh, I encourage you to go there and check it out. I've also got a blog on there that talks about actually just getting started creating your figures and what are some of the initial questions that you need to answer, like RGB versus CMYK, what do these things actually mean? So go to ecrlife.org in order to check those out. For design instruction, um, I have a blog that I've been trying to start for a little while. Um, I'm a little slow to post, but hopefully I'll get better at it. Um, and here I'm trying to show, for instance, how you build things in Illustrator, how you can use image trace as your friend, um, different things to that nature. Uh, so that's at visi.com. Uh, and then there are also three websites that offer lessons and tutorials um, that are very handy. There's uh, design.tuts plus um, that will give you uh, great tutorials for Illustrator and Photoshop. And then there's also a graphic design stack exchange um, for questions that you run into. And then finally, I know many colleges and universities partner with lynda.com to give you free access to lessons there. So hopefully all of these resources will be helpful for you.
So just to finish up, I'd like to say thank you so much. Um, I've really enjoyed giving this presentation to you all, and I look forward to any questions that you might have. Great, thank you. I certainly learned a lot. And just a reminder for everybody um, tuning in today that we will have this recorded on our YouTube channel in a few weeks. So if you're wanting to go back and find those resources, um, it will be available. So if you weren't able to write them down as she was going through, they are gonna be available. Um, I also have to say, I'm sorry, on some of your slides, there were some lines that were appearing. I think it was through the GoToWebinar, um, and I was struggling whether or not to let you know because I wasn't sure there was anything you could do about it. Um, and also, I realized that this is a presentation about visual presentation, and then we had these random lines. So um, it wasn't too bad. It didn't obscure anything that we were trying to see, but um, we're going to try to fix that for the recording on, on the YouTube. Um, Perfect. Yeah, sometimes go to webinar. I've had it where my slides shift. So sometimes it happens. So I apologize for anyone who's tuning in. Those random lines were not supposed to be there. Um, great. So I learned a lot. Uh, I importantly learned about Courier, how it's the font size that all the letters are the same size. And I think for me, that's going to be very helpful in the type of work that I, that I do. Um, please send in your questions on Twitter using the hashtag ECR Wednesday and add your questions in, in the panel on the right. Uh, and we'll have a few minutes now to go through some of them. Now, first, um, as a question, what's your number one tip for knowing if you've done a good job and made your figure clear enough to understand? Is there, is there one thing that you go to initially to, to decide that? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the best thing that you can do is take your figure and put it in front of someone else. So uh, even along the stages before you've gotten to the very end, um, take it and put it in front of someone who maybe they're not even in your science field, but ask them what they understand from the figure. So um, regardless of whether or not they're in your field, they should be able to tell you, for instance, what are you even showing? What are your graphs trying to depict? Um, what conclusion do they draw from uh, the figures that you present? Can they actually see these differences that you're trying to point out on this immunostain? Um, and based off of others' input, it'll really help inform you what you're actually communicating. Great. Um, another question. What are your pet peeves in figure design? Definitely uh, pet peeves are whenever there's something super distracting on the page. Um, for instance, uh, let's say someone wants to uh, use an ornamental font like papyrus, make it super huge, um, and uh, it, it's distracting because it keeps me from uh, quickly consuming what I'm, I'm trying to get to. And also similarly, if I'm not able to understand the, the key point of a graph, so for instance, the graph that I was showing where it was missing the axes and suddenly there was this label with plus cocaine in the, in the top right hand mm -hmm. corner. I had no idea what they were trying to say with that graph, which is just instantly frustrating. So mm -hmm. I think it's probably very similar to, to anyone reading a figure. If you're not able to actually understand what the person is trying to tell you, um, then that's certainly frustrating. Yeah, that is certainly frustrating. Um, okay, next question. How do you get started when you're making figures? What is the first thing that you do uh, when you're about to start? So when you're crafting a paper, typically you're trying to organize data um, from the very start and you're trying to make it logically uh, have a flow. Um, and so you're trying to group different pieces of data um, how they fit together. And the easiest way to do this is basically just to take out a pen and paper and sketch it out. And so uh, just sketch out, for instance, you know that you'll have an immunostain here. It'll take about that much amount of room. Um, you know you need a certain number of graphs. Um, sketching it on paper will save you a lot of time in how to create that hierarchy um, before you actually even take it to a design software. That's a great idea. Um, seems kind of obvious, but some of us <laughs> did not think to do that. It's tempting um, to go to that design, you know, software yeah. platform and just stare at the page for a while, but <laughs> much easier to, to sketch and be able to erase quickly. Yeah, no, that's a great idea. So another question is, how do you know what font size to use when you're making a figure or diagram so that when you put it into a PowerPoint presentation, it's still legible? <laughs> 
Right. Um, so going between design software and PowerPoint can sometimes be very frustrating. Mm -hmm. um, and it can be a bit of trial and error. I'd say the very best thing that you can do is uh, find a way in order to hook up your computer to a projector, um, even better if it's the one you're actually going to be using for your presentation, and see how the type is displayed. And basically test out uh, the size that is to your eye appearing the one that you'll want to use. Um, and then you'll have a framework for, okay, I know that if I go below this, it's gonna be too low. If I go above this, it's going to overwhelm my uh, titles and my other information. And so being able to have that access to a, a projector would be number one for figuring that out. Um, but when you're building these graphs in the first place, you're creating that hierarchy of um, the title versus the axes versus the actual data. And so that naturally will give you um, your proper proportions if you follow that logical um, size variety. And so too small, um, I'd say it's probably a judgment factor and playing with the, uh, the projector will help you with that. But, um, Definitely how you see it on a page that you're viewing will give you insight into for a PowerPoint. Great. Um, which software do you recommend to create figures? I know you had mentioned GraphPad mm -hmm. Prism. Do you know of any free options that you recommend? Yeah. So being trained as a graphic designer, I was trained in all of the Adobe programs, which I know are not free. Um, be sure to check if you're uh, employed or, or working at a university, see if they offer it for free because it is a wonderful resource. But I know it is very expensive if uh, you don't have access to that for free through your university. So instead, there is a program called Ins Inkscape, um, which you can use, which is a vector-based program, also just like Illustrator. It's very similar to Illustrator, um, which will allow you to build figures within that sort of platform. Uh, within a vector platform. And this is mentioned in the blog uh, that I wrote for ECR Life, but certainly when you're making your figures, um, try to use a vector-based program um, because that will give you freedom of scalability uh, because a vector-based platform isn't reliant upon pixels, it's reliant upon a series of points. And if you use Photoshop, you're going to have to have it at a very high resolution, which is going to take um, a great deal of memory in order to compute um, the size that you'll need for printing. And so Illustrator or Inkscape would be your friend for making a figure. There's also a program called InDesign, which is used to um, create uh, book layouts. Um, but I would say probably stick, if you're going to learn one, learn Illustrator because it's the most um, flexible for creating a figure. Great. Now, what do you think about black slides or posters with white text. Um, the attendee says that they've been seeing, seeing them gain popularity and actually find them less straining to read. Now you had talked a little yes. bit about the bright colors and the, the light text, but what about black and white? Sure, no, that's a really good question. Um, I actually prefer for a presentation that black background. Um, I also find it less jarring. I find it more difficult for immunostains because you have a dark background on a dark background. Mm -hmm. But as you mentioned, that requires you to have a light colored text. Um, and for that, the difference between white and black is less jarring than for instance, a fluorescent yellow on a dark blue background. But you still run into that problem of being able to see that thin um, type onto a darker background. So you would want to use a bolder font in order to see it easier. Um, just to be able to distinguish that uh, for all um, individuals. Okay, let's see. Oh, also I wanna point out, um, you mentioned a poster. Uh, and for a poster, printing it out on um, in a dark background, sometimes that can consume a great deal of ink. Um, and if you're conscious about wanting to use less ink on your poster, um, then perhaps use a lighter background. Uh, but um, again, it is a nice contrast um, to have the white on the black in that situation too. Um, how do you feel about grid lines for bar graphs? 
I like grid lines, but only if they're very faint. Um, if you make them too strong, they'll certainly get in the way uh, and it can make it difficult in order to actually understand where your data is falling on the grid if it's too strong. You'll have problems distinguishing the actual data lines from the grid lines. So if you make them very faint, I think they can be helpful. So we have time for just one last question. Um, but if we haven't covered your questions here, just remember that we're going to continue, continue um, the Twitter chat. So we'll try our best to answer anything you have posted on Twitter. Um, but a final question from one of the attendees. On a multiple linear regression graph, is it allowed to put regression equations on the top of each regression line? So how do you feel about the equations on the, on the regression lines? Or how, right. how would you best present it? Yeah, so for that, it really depends on the audience that you're going towards, for instance. Um, if it's an audience where you need to have that bit of information um, there, then uh, find um, a way in order perhaps to have it in uh, a size that works well. What you can also do is assign, um, for instance, a letter system where you can have the equations off to the side and align a letter to, to draw you to what you're actually seeing. Um, but uh, you, it has to be a judgment as far as are you creating uh, something that's too busy and chaotic to understand or um, is it just um, you know, a small number that you're adding on to there. Um, and so depending on that, you might want to pull the equations over to the side. That's a great tip. Now, we've, before we close, do you have any closing remarks? No, and anything I just want, you want to leave us with? Um, no, just wanted to, uh, well, uh, a couple of things that you can also do is I want to encourage you whenever you're making your figures too, that you really need to keep those raw data files um, and keep them separate when you're making your figures. So just go ahead and create a folder, put all of your raw data in there, um, and then create a separate set that you're actually using for cropping and, and creating of your figures because you'll need to go back to those. And in fact, journals sometimes will ask you to go back to those raw images. So make sure to keep them separate in a folder. Um, that's just a little tip that I know working with people and figures, I can't tell you the number of times someone said, ah, oh, no, I cropped that and it was my only version. So be sure to keep those separately. Um, okay. And thanks again so much for uh, hosting the webinar and allowing me to share these tips with you. Great. Well, thank you. Um, and thank you to everybody who tuned in today and contributed to the discussion. It was a wonderful opportunity to learn more about creating the most effective figures for research in the life sciences. I know I certainly learned a lot. Um, our next ECR Wednesday webinar will be held on February 27th. And the topic will be queer and LGBTQ representation in STEM. So please look for that and register. And that's it for today. Have a great day and hope to continue the, the Twitter discussions. Thanks, everybody. We're done. Woo! Um,